Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Mark Hirschberg. He's a startup CTO, author, and instructor at MIT. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. You've done a crazy amount of stuff in a good way. But before we get into all of that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. I grew up outside of a couple major cities. So I was born in New York, but grew up briefly okay. in Westchester and then okay, mostly cool. outside Chicago and New Jersey. Very cool. So you went to university. What did you take and why? At MIT, I double majored as an undergrad in physics wow. and electrical engineering, computer science, minored in <laughs> so, political so, science. So pretty, pretty easy stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, you know, light course load. And then I stayed wow. to get my graduate degree in cryptography. Interesting. So what made you passionate about those things? Was there defining moments in, in your childhood or walk us through that? There was. As a little kid, I was interested in kind of the occult, ghosts, Atlantis, the pyramids, all those kind of interesting, interesting. historical questions. And whenever they talk about the pyramids or things like that, they always talk about, oh, did aliens build it? Did aliens go to Atlantis? So aliens and black holes and time travel inevitably get brought up. And sure. when I was nine, my cousin, who was a little bit older than me, talked about how in his high school physics class, they were studying black holes. I thought, oh, oh physics, that's where we learn this cool stuff. So that's what got me into physics. Very cool. Interesting. Okay, what about the rest of stuff? For computer science, I wanted to go into politics. I wanted to be a lawyer. But okay. in ninth grade, the uh, the one elective I could pick, because I said, here's your math, here's your English. The one right. elective, justice, was not being offered. And okay. I had no idea what to take instead. But my guidance counselor wisely said, well, why don't you take introduction to computer programming? She was smart enough to say, I know computers are the future. So she steered me in that direction, and I loved it. And that's what got me on the path to do computer science. Interesting. Okay, very cool. So walk us through your career and kind of what you're doing today, because you've done a ton of stuff, right? And you've had a ton of experience doing a bunch of different things in a bunch of different verticals. So walk us through your career, maybe some career highlights and any kind of advice around maybe even some failures or, or some kind of things you wish you would do differently. I think of myself as having two parallel careers. I came okay. out of MIT in the 90s during the dot-com era. And I started right. as a software developer and I quickly realized I wanted to become a CTO. But to okay, be why? the CTO, uh, I was interested because it has a different set of challenges. I love the technology. I love solving those puzzles. But when you get to the leadership and management issues, it's a much more complex type of puzzle. With engineering, sure. there are right and wrong answers. And maybe you're trading off, do you want to do it this way or that way? But there are some objectively right answers. When it comes to dealing with interpersonal issues, to managing people, to leading, to building teams, there's no one right way to do it. And so that level of complexity was really interesting to me. You know, that's, that's interesting. Okay, so how did you make that transition into a CTO role? I realized that to be the CTO, it wasn't just about being a good software developer. Certainly I had to have the technical knowledge, but I had to develop these other skills team building, hiring, leadership, communications, negotiations, all these skills they never taught me in school. So I set out to learn how to develop them. And I create a plan for how I'm going to learn these and how I'm going to take jobs. You can't just go from software engineer to CTO. You have to do some things along the way to prove you can handle the big chair. So I sure. created that plan and began to execute on it. And in my 
first career, this one side of these parallel paths, I worked at early stage startups that then grew. I did some consulting work because my mentors have suggested if you do this, you can pick and choose and very, fo very much focus on where you want to develop yourself. I helped a couple of Fortune 500s play startup and then I've been in and out of traditional startups. But along this path, I noted I had to develop these skills in myself. Once I began to develop them, as I was hiring, I wanted to hire people who had them because I understood the value. So when I would interview a software engineer, I'd ask them how to configure a server, they'd give me the right answer. But then I would ask them, what are the key elements for a successful team? And I'd get a blank stare. Because of course, we never talk about this in our undergraduate education. Sure. And I realized other people didn't have this as well. So I had to build, not buy, right? I couldn't find people with these skills. I had to train them up. I had been doing this for a little while, and I heard MIT had gotten similar feedback. Companies said to MIT, look, you have smart kids, great knowledge, but the people we want to hire aren't just technically strong. We want people with leadership skills, communication, negotiation, team building. We can't find this. And it's not just MIT students. Colleges across the country have gotten similar feedback, and it's not just college students. Corporate America wants to see people with these skills Big companies, small companies, we all want people with these skills. So MIT began to develop this program. I heard about that. I reached out. I said, look, I've been working on something similar. Can I help? They said, please do. So I helped develop the program, and they invited me to help teach it, which in this second career I've been doing for the past 20 years, teaching at MIT and elsewhere. Wow. Very cool. So walk me through... What made you decide to write a book and how did you come up with the idea for it? And then we'll dive into what the book's called and, and go from there. I wasn't actually planning on writing a book. I'm probably one okay. of the few authors who said I, I <laughs> didn't set out to do this. For years, I had said to MIT, look, we need to take this content. We need to put it online because, again, it's not just MIT students who need this. And MIT right. has always been fantastic about sharing its content online for free. That's awesome. But we just haven't had the time and resources in the program. So I was traveling a lot for work. I was seeing a lot of planes and a lot of hotels where I had downtime. I thought, let me just write up some class notes. I really thought I was writing down maybe about 20 pages as an outline, as a summary of what we do. And 20 pages quickly became 50, became 100. Wow. I started to realize this might actually be a book. And that's how the book was born. Very cool. Okay, so what's the book called and what can people learn from the book? It's called The Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. The book itself is divided into three sections. So first section, careers, how to create and execute a career plan, how to work effectively, things like managing your manager, understanding corporate culture and politics and how you add value, and how to interview. Now, interviewing, there's a lot of content how to interview as a candidate. We don't really train people how to interview as a hiring manager. I've met many executives who have said, yeah, no one ever taught me how to interview, but they've been hiring people throughout their careers. Second section, leadership and management skills. And these skills are not just for people with certain titles. They are the fundamentals to be a leader, to use management techniques, even from day one on the job as an individual contributor. Then the third section has fundamental skills, communication, networking, negotiations, and ethics. Interesting. Okay. So why did you choose those three sections and, and to break up the book into those sections? The topics themselves all come from this feedback that we've gotten from companies saying these are the skills we want. And I thought about how do we introduce them? What's the right ordering? One thing I've done in the book is you can jump into any chapter. You can say, I just need to learn how to negotiate because I have one coming up next week. So you can jump straight to that chapter. But okay. one reason I chose to put them all in one book is because they also reinforce each other. Good right. leaders know how to negotiate. Good negotiators know how to communicate. And so they reinforce each other, but I wanted to put them into some logical groupings. So the first three, 
if you think about it, you go from almost broad to narrow that how do I create a career plan mm -hmm. within an individual job? How do I make the most out of that job? And even how do I get that job or how do I hire someone else for a particular job? So it goes from the broad career plans down to that very specific interviewing hiring process. Gotcha. The second piece, leadership and management, uh, something everyone's interested in and those logically fit together. I do break down the difference between leadership and management. In the real world, they blur. No one says I'm just going to do one or the other, but it's important to understand the different elements. And okay. the third what is the section, difference, just for the listeners, sorry to cut you off there. Sure, no, no problem. Leading is about having a future state and influencing people to join together to achieve that state. That is leading. It is setting forth the vision and goal. Management is about the execution. When Candy said, let's put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, he was leading. He didn't then say, okay, now I have to figure out how are we going to do this? He had a whole bunch of other people to deal with the execution of that, right? And that was the management of it. So that's right. how you can think up dividing them. But most of us, most leaders, other than say a president or maybe a CEO, don't lead without managing. Most managers do some leadership as well. So they do blur together, but it is important to note that distinction. No, makes total sense. And then the third section? Third section are these fundamental skills that are going to support you in the execution of those first two sections, right? These are the base skills you need when you interact with other people. Makes makes total sense. So you also launched an app around the book. What? How does the app complement the book? And do you need, can you use one without the other? You can, but I think they work better together. Now, okay. the app, which is free, it's on the Android and iPhone stores, and it's downloadable from my website. With the app, I thought about books, and I thought about every time I read a book like mine, any business book, a self-help book, you read it, you say, wow, really great tips, and then you forget it, right? Three weeks later, you forget it. Maybe sure. you take a few notes, you never even look at them again. I wanted to make the book useful. It's not just about, ooh, did I sell a copy? It's, did I give someone content to help them in their career? So I thought about educational techniques. One very well-known one is spaced repetition. That's a fancy name for going back to look at the content again. Commonly, we do this with flashcards. Now, right. there are flashcard apps, but no one wants to open an app and do flashcards on a book they're reading. So I took the idea of daily affirmations. There are apps that will each day they send you a little daily affirmation or your daily horoscope. That idea, when you download this free app, it sits on your phone. You don't even need to open it. Each day it's going to pop up one of the tips. You can set it to a chapter. So if you're reading the negotiation chapter to learn about negotiations, you set just for negotiation tips and each day it's going to pop up a tip. Oh, right. Reminder, preparation helps you be more successful in negotiations. Okay, looked at, swipe it away, takes three seconds, and it's going to make the content stick more and help you get more value out of the book. The other way you can use it, if you're about to walk into a negotiation, you are probably not carrying my book with you. If you're walking into an interview, a networking event, you don't carry books around with you. We as content creators need to make our content available when, where, and how people want to consume it. And so that means taking it out from the pages and putting it into a more convenient format, in this case, the app. So right before you go into that negotiation, you can open it up and say, right, here's how I make an opening, opening offer. Here's how I think about countering. Here's how I think about combining issues. You just swipe through it all very quickly and get that crash course to refresh. So you can read the book without the app. If you want, download the free app without buying the book and get some of those tips, although I think it's more useful when it's reinforcing what you've read in the book. No, that makes total sense. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Just I think your point about and I've done it before, too, is like you're right before you you go into an interview or networking or whatever. It's nice to just like quickly pull up something and like quickly look at like a couple of tips or things to think about while you're just about to do that. Right. And it's cool that you're doing that. And I hope kind of more books actually build an app like this 
with their you know content right and then the other thing too is you could obviously push new content as things change over the years absolutely and you know i didn't intend to build this app i figured someone else must have done this so i looked to license it when i found it didn't exist that's where the entrepreneur in me said well here's a problem here's an opportunity right. So I not only built the app, I filed a patent on it and built a white label version because Very I cool. know other authors and content creators will need this. So this will probably wind up as a little side business of mine. No, I, I think that's that's actually really good advice for even people listening, right? Is you find a problem, you're like, oh, there's somebody's got to have solved this. And then they didn't. So you do it, right? Absolutely. That's how entrepreneurship begins. Totally. So you mentioned something to me that's resonated with me recently and, and just kind of got me thinking a lot. And I think it'll resonate with a lot of listeners as well is how to create a learning organization and promoting, you know, where even somebody that's maybe junior or even day one, they just started that they feel comfortable enough to kind of move through their career, learn new things and maybe challenge uh, some of the, current ways people do things and, and maybe present new ways to maybe make things better? Yeah, peer learning is so important for two reasons. First, we learn this content better through peer learning. If you're learning a new software language, if you're learning the new accounting regulations, that's just memorizing information. Read a book, listen to a podcast, great, get that information. But when it comes to these skills, there's no simple algorithm for leading. There's no three-step plan for communicating. So the, the best way to learn it is to look at situations and discuss it with other people to get different perspectives. How would you approach this? How would she approach this? Okay, those are interesting ideas I might not have thought of. And so it helps me have a richer understanding of how to approach this. It also is helpful because if you have these skills, you know they're going to make you more successful. If everyone on your team or everyone within your organization that you run has these skills, everyone's going to be so much more effective. The whole organization gets this massive lift. Imagine if everyone in your organization was 2% more effective, right? That sounds like a tiny amount, but when everyone does it, wow, it's going to hit your bottom line so well. So the way you can do this, it's the way we teach this at MIT. It's the way business schools have taught this for years is you create these peer learning groups. Create, I recommend small pods of around six to eight people. Okay. But you can also do this with larger groups of 20 or 80 people. And on my website, on the resources page, the first download explains how to do this, how you can do this at your organization, whether it's one that you're part of, one that you help start and run, or if your organization doesn't do this, or if you're a solopreneur, Find other people in your community, create a meetup group, find other people and create this group. So you create these small pods and then you want to take some content. So I'll give you an example with my book. You can break down the book into chapters and subsections. I have a breakdown of how you can do this for different types of goals. Read each section, say every two weeks you read a different section and then you have that discussion and that's what enriches your understanding. Now, I've mentioned you can use my book as a download on the website. The download is free. If you don't want to use my book, feel free not to. Use one of the other great books I list on the resources page. Use other business books you've been meaning to read. Use videos, blogs. Use podcasts. Use a great podcast like this one where everyone listens to this content, and then you discuss this content with that group. What's important is that you take some content but then have that discussion around it. And that's what's going to really help develop these soft skills within you and your team. Interesting. So, and you probably get asked this a lot, but I'm always kind of curious, how do you maybe as an employee try to get this actually implemented at your company? And, and then the flip side of that, as an employer, like sometimes that can be scary to kind of give employees this much freedom? Have you found that or what are your thoughts around those? I tend to like startups. And the great okay. thing about startups is that you can kind of do anything. There's right. not a big structure about these are the rules and what we do and don't. Everyone is too overwhelmed. So at these earlier, smaller startup companies, 
walking up and saying, I want to take this initiative and set this up, usually someone says, yeah, fantastic, sounds good. At a sure. larger company, you want to be more structured. And certainly there are some issues. If you're talking about, for example, office politics, yeah. HR is going to say, oh, wait a second, you know, this could turn into a bitch fest. What do we do? And I, in the document, I explain, here's how to think through ground rules. So one technique, for example, is you can discuss these issues, but you never give examples from the current company. Talk about your friend's ah. companies, prior companies, and this way it doesn't have any negative effect on the current organization you're in. So I go through these issues. And in fact, in this download, when I break this down, I say, because uh, I give this to HR as well, I say, look, take this idea, cross my name out, put your name on it. You as the HR person, you are the hero. You're saying, look at this great program I created. Take all the credit for it. This is so much better than what HR usually does, which is where I say, we're going to pick five lucky winners or five rising stars <laughs> and sure. spend $2,000 ahead, sending them to some offsite training. So sure. now five people develop, but the rest don't. When you do this way, for less money, more people develop, you build a common language because people can say, if, for example, you use the book Good to Great, people can say, oh, it's the hedgehog model. Everyone goes, yep, right, hedgehog, what they talked about in the book. You build better relationships between people in the company. You get to know more people in different groups and you increase employee engagement. This is just a win all around. So when HR looks at and really understands it, they're usually pretty receptive. Interesting. Well, and chances are you might even have some sort of personal um, friendship with somebody in HR, especially if you're at a big company, right? Like chances are, you know, you probably have a team of them. And so you probably have some sort of common ground with hopefully at least one of them, right? Absolutely. And the great thing about this process, it even works on Zoom. So while we've all been yeah. isolated at home, companies can set this up and increase engagement even while we're remote. Interesting. So how do you think that things will be similar or different uh, in this learning space post-COVID? That's a really good question. Unfortunately, learning and development is usually one of the first things to go whenever oh. there's a recession. Yep. So in, in the round of layoffs, everyone just cut this. And in fairness, learning and development was not a high priority this past year. It was trying to figure out what the heck is happening in the world, how do we adjust our strategy, budgets got tightened. So I, I'm sympathetic to companies needing to do that. When and how they bring it back, uh, that's an open question. Because okay. even if, let's suppose magically by June 1st, everyone's vaccinated, we're all back to normal. We know it's it's not quite so discreet, but let's pretend that happens. We're going to see a wave of change. A lot of people have been thinking about changing jobs, but they haven't wanted to do it during this chaotic period. So we're right. going to see a lot of movement in the second half of the year. We're going to see companies reorg. Companies are now going to move to a permanent remote or semi-remote plans. So they're going to change up how they operate. They're going to work to get back to business as normal. I think education and training is probably going to be lower on that list. HR is very busy just trying to get things back to the new normal and learning and development is probably number seven on the list. So we might not see a reinvestment into this, unfortunately, until probably 2022. Okay. But I also think just setting that realistic expectation for people as well and employers to say like, look, like it might just not happen for another year or so just, and it's like, it sucks, but like there's other things that are more important, right? Right. But I think smaller organizations, organizations of tens of people, maybe just a few hundred, they're yep. a little more nimble. And I think they can begin to roll these things out even in Q3 or Q4 of this year. Sure. But I also think it's not stopping people from individually doing it on their own time either. Not at all. And this is why if your company isn't going to do it, do it yourself. You can do this with friends of yours. You can do this with community groups. You might be part of meetups of other entrepreneurs, for example, or you just create a meetup around this and create those discussion groups and do it yourself. It doesn't, there's not a lot of overhead to this. There's no real complication. 
get some content and then discuss it in groups. Sure. So what do you, or what advice do you give to people that they're, they're say they're too busy for this stuff. And, and I get it. Like it's hard if you work full time and you have a family and, or maybe you don't have a family, like there's tons of things happening around, or like maybe you enjoy, well, I know probably you're not doing a ton of sports or other activities right now, but there's other things that people want to do outside of kind of constantly professionally develop. What advice do you give to them to maybe try to make some time, maybe even like a few times a year or once a year or something like that? That's exactly it. Even just doing it a few times a year, the return on this is massive. So let's consider the following example. I'm going to pick negotiation because it's a very okay. clear example. Suppose you are an employee and you are 30 years old. You get a job offer for $70,000. Okay. But you just read a negotiation book. You spent 10 hours learning a little about negotiation. So you go back and say, before I take this job, I want to negotiate the salary. And you negotiate 71000 That's okay. not a huge lift, right? This isn't a big stretch. Sure. You get $1,000 more. takes you five minutes to negotiate it. And now you stay at that job for the next 30 years of your career. What happened? You made $1,000 more for 30 years. You just right. earned $30,000 from reading a book and doing one five-minute negotiation. Right. But of course, you're not going to stay in that job for 30 years. You're going to have raises and promotions and new jobs. You're going to get more than $1,000. If you just read a single book on negotiations and spend a little time developing these negotiation skills and negotiating once every couple of years on your salary, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. Isn't it worth investing 10 hours a year, 20 hours a year to generate that type of return? Now, I gave negotiations as the example because it's the most obvious. You negotiate, boom, more money. People don't say, wow, you're a great communicator. Here's $1,000 more. It's not going to be quite as direct. But if you get a little better at communicating, at leading, at team building, at expanding your network, all these things together are going to lead up to more opportunities, more success, more income. So the ROI on spending a few tens of hours a year on these skills. You already do so because if you're in law, you have to take continuing education credits in law. If you're in technology, you have to learn new technologies. Accounting, learn the new accounting rules. All of us invest in our domain skills. What I'm suggesting is if you take a couple hours either in addition or instead of that domain skill and invest in some of these others, you get a massive ROI that will clearly justify that time investment. I 100% agree with you. And I think th I've had this conversation with people before. And I just, I think the simplest version I've that seems to have worked for me is you just say like, okay, like how much Netflix or, or some other streaming service or TV or whatever do you watch in a week? And they might be like, oh, I'll just be like, well, if they don't know, just be like, well, just calculate it, spend a week and figure it out. It's like, take one hour out of that a week or every two weeks and just like try doing your side project or read a book or, or like whatever, right? And you will realize how quick that adds up, right? And how much you actually learn by just taking like an hour twice a month or instead of just binge watching that extra episode, right? Like it's, it's, I find like if you give somebody that like small change, it's way easier than saying you need to read a book a month or a book a week. It's like, nobody's going to do that, right? Like going from zero to that is just, I find a lot of people, they just don't, they just can't make that big of a life change. Do you agree? Or it sounds like you're going to agree. Absolutely. And this is one of the things I emphasize in the book. It's about these small changes. It's about not becoming a world-class leader, but getting just a little bit better at leading. And this is why for my book, I've done it. So the chapters stand independently. You don't have to say, oh, I have to read all 270 pages. You can say, all right, I'm going to read these 20 pages. You know what? I can knock that out this week. It's going to take me 30, 45 minutes. Boom. Read the pages. Done. Picked up a little more competence in this particular skill. So you can address it as you need. To your point, all of us gained a lot of commute time recently. All that time we spent in our cars, on subways, we got that back while we sat at home. 
And so you can use some of that time now, or if you get back into the car, listen to perhaps audiobooks or podcasts like this, and you can pick up that extra time. No, I, I 100% agree with you. I've listened to a bunch of books just in the car driving, just even anywhere, right? Like if, even if you're going for coffee or something and you just need to get out of the house or whatever, just like turn something on for 15, 20 minutes, you'd be surprised how fast you chew through an audio book, right? Or a podcast or, or whatever. Absolutely. We can all find the time if we look for it. So I'm curious, you've obviously been at this a number of years. You've taught for a couple decades now. Is there any advice or things that you maybe see all the time that you maybe want to like demystify or wish people didn't do so much of or, or wish that they did more of? Like, do you have any kind of advice or of things that you've seen kind of recently that we could maybe demystify a little bit? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick a few of them. So one is that with these skills, you have to be a master. And I want to emphasize sure. again, it's not about being world class. It's not about being the greatest leader. As you make these incremental changes, they will add up and have a huge effect on your bottom line. Another is that you need to spend a lot of time learning about this. One of the most important things to do early on is to get a mental shift, is to just change how you look at things. So let me give a mental shift on leadership, because this is a very sure. common misconception. Many young people I speak to in college, in their 20s, when they're in an individual contributor role, they think, well, I will become a leader when? When I get this promotion, when I get this title, right? Once I'm supervising others, that's when I'm a leader. Now, as we mentioned earlier, leadership is about proposing a new future state and influencing people to get there. When we think about some of the greatest leaders of the 20th century, people like Martin Luther King, he had no authority. He didn't hold political office. He didn't command other people. He went out and he spoke to people. He said, this is what we want to do. Here is the change we want to make. And he inspired people and convinced people and people began to follow him. Because of that, he ultimately had some positions at certain groups that were then pushing for this change. But his ability to lead came from the work he did, not from some authority given to him. All of us can be a leader from day one. The authority, the ability to say, we're doing this because I'm in charge and I say so, that comes from having the title. But your ability to lead happens day one. And of course, we all know if you had a boss who just said, do it because I say so, we don't want to work for that person. We want to do it because the boss says, here's what I think we should do and here's why. That boss is leading, not commanding. All of us can develop these leadership skills and begin to lead ourselves early on. And once you get that mindset shift, you go from being 22 and thinking, well, I hope to lead in 10 years to I'm going to spend the next 10 years leading and I'm going to get that leadership position the formal authority position much sooner because I will be acting like and perceived as a leader. You know, I, I actually think that's, that's really good advice. Right. And it's such a simple, like it, it's, it's such a simple thing to do. Right. And, and kind of change your mindset and outlook on your day to day uh, work. Yeah. I'll give you another one. Sure. Networking. Many people, yeah. particularly introverts, hate networking. They feel it's underhanded. They feel it's a little sleazy. It's, it doesn't feel comfortable. And that's because most people get networking wrong. It's been made worse by social media. So sure. people, the traditional view is I'm going to go network by going into this large room. And in 20 minutes, I'm going to meet 10 people and walk away with 10 new business cards. Fantastic. I'm going to add a whole bunch of people on LinkedIn. Adding someone on LinkedIn and saying, this stranger is now in your network, that's like swiping right on someone on Tinder and saying, this person is now your significant other. That's not sure. how it works. When you swipe right on Tinder, what happens? Okay, you've expressed some mutual interest. Now you have to build that relationship, which in right. dating means you go on dates. In your professional network, you don't just say we're connected, boom, we're networked. 
Now you have to build that relationship. It's not about having a thousand connections, collecting all these business cards. It is about meeting one person and building a relationship with that person. So even if you're introverted, don't worry about meeting 100 people in the room. Don't even worry about going to these crowded events. Meet one person. However you choose to meet this person, build that relationship. And again, to a whole bunch of techniques you can use, but it means following up. It means reaching out. It means getting together for coffee one-on-one, -on -one, so it's not some big, overwhelming event that introverts don't like. It's just about, over time, building a relationship we all have friends, we all have colleagues, we know how to build relationships. And when you switch to that mentality from, I need to collect 500 new business cards this year, to I need to build some new relationships, you get a much more valuable, useful network than just a whole bunch of connections to strangers who aren't gonna be there for you when you need it. Sure, the other thing that I'm curious then is obviously, you, you shouldn't always expect results for maybe ever, like it might take months, years to ever do any sort of business or deal together, right? I think that also kind of gets lost sometimes. Absolutely. Too many people think, oh, I need a new job. Time to go network, right? Time to go meet yeah. people. So here's the question to ask yourself. If you need to borrow $10,000, who are you going to borrow it from? The person you met at a conference last week? or your best friend from high school who you've known for 20 years? Sure. Who's the one more likely to be there for you? Now, I, I, money just illustrates this concretely. We shouldn't think about networking in terms of money, but it's that relationship that builds up over time. Harvey Mackey is a wonderful author, and one of his books is titled, Dig Your Well Before You're Thirsty. Right? And that's how we have to yeah. think about networking. You want to build the network before you use it. Because when you've built those relationships, now you can go to it when you need something. Just as you can borrow from friends, you can call on friends for big favors when you've known them a while, not someone you just met. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Do you have maybe one more for us as we kind of come to the end of the recording? One other tip is on career plans. Okay. So many people think, well, you can't really plan for your career. I mean, let's think about what I spoke about. I said I wanted to go into politics. I never intended to write a book. The app was intended. Wow, all this stuff, you know, Mark, there's proof. You can't plan for this. Well, that's not true. You can't guarantee an outcome. Let's think about what you do at work. When you have a project, when the CEO says, here's what we need to build, you've got a year, go build it. Would you ever say, okay, great, let's just uh, not bother with any plans. Let's just wing it. You know, we know what we have to do. Let's go forth and see where we wind up in a year. Of course not, right? You know, that's guaranteed disaster. You create a project plan, a timeline, a budget, risk list, however you choose to do it. Now, we know with near certainty, you will not exactly follow that plan. Something's going to go wrong, right? The CEO might change the ultimate goal. You might have a pandemic shows up and throws everything into chaos. Things are going to fall behind schedule. We know this will happen. But by having the plan, what happens is we say, okay, we're on plan. We're off plan. How do we adjust the plan? How do we get back on track? How do we reset expectations? Eisenhower famously said, plans are worthless, but planning is everything. Our careers are much longer than a year. Our careers are decades. Would you ever work on a decade-long project and say, yeah, let's not create any plans. Let's just hope we wind up there in a few decades. <laughs> you want sure. to create yeah. these plans, right? Now, it's going to be fuzzy further out. It gets more specific in the near term. You can change the plans anytime you want. It's your plan. If you realize this is not the path I want to be on, go change it. You're going to do regular check-ins every six or 12 months. And you're going to say, you know what, I plan to do this. And then a pandemic came along. And so they canceled the project where I was going to grow a new skill. And my plans to take this class externally, that didn't happen either. Okay, reset, readjust. What do I want to do? But by having that plan, doing these regular check-ins and doing these little course corrections, you're going to increase your chances of success. Without a plan, you're nearly guaranteeing failure. No, 
I, I think that's actually really good advice. But sadly, we're coming to the end of the show. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself, the book, and the app, and any other links you want to mention? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There you can learn about the book. You can, of course, buy on Amazon, local bookstores, lots of different places. You can get in touch with me, download the app. You can download the resource I mentioned from the resources page, the one that's going to teach you how you can set up this type of peer learning group. There's a whole bunch of other books and resources linked from the resources page. The app, the resources, they're all free. Everything you can get at thecareertoolkitbook.com. Perfect, Mark. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future. <laughs>